Thank you, Brother Winkler, and I'm de indeed happy to pinch hit for Brother Moffat. Uh, if I can't fill his place, I'll wiggle around in it. And I'm certainly happy to... Uh, so many of you got up early this morning and came. I was thinking uh, about the time when he said get together with the time. It was my good fortune to fall heir to my father's pocket watch. And uh, he was known for not uh, being easy to run out of soap anyhow. And uh, he didn't preach sermonettes. And I pulled this watch out to time a sermon where we used to live when I was a boy. And uh, some of the people became uh, suspicious, I think. They thought that sermon could just keep time for long sermons. That watch could just keep time for long sermons. <clears throat> Hardiman, my brother, went back to Jasper, where Dad preached for 43 years, and was there in a meeting. And he told the church how happy all of us were, are, that the, and the how grateful we are for the way they treated Mother and Dad and for the love that we have for the church, and said, uh, I'll admit now that I'm prejudiced, but said, I think Dad's one of the greatest preachers in the world. And there were a lot of amens and people nodding their head and said, uh, uh, well, I appreciate the fact you agree with me. Said, however, there's one way in which I excel him. And everybody straightened up and smiles disappeared and wondered what's that young whippersnapper think he is. And uh, he said, and that's in quitting on time. <laughs> One brother in Lamar County, Alabama, where my father preached in this man's home and eventually started a congregation, his name was Curry, and the Christian Chapel Church near Vernon, Alabama, started in Brother Curry's home. Dad was preaching in a meeting in there in, on his, in his front yard one year before the church house was built, and... Uh, Brother Curry, in his prayer, would often say, We thank thee for this hour we've spent in thy service. That night, Brother Curry had to go to town after church, and the roads back then were not paved and not even all gravel, and uh, cars were uh, in the... This was in the 20s, and the, uh, the old Model T Fords were about the only things that could get over the roads. And uh, Brother Curry had that trip to make after church. And the service lasted and lasted and lasted. And finally, when they called on him to dismiss, the neighbors tell me that this actually happened, and his son said that it did too. He said that Brother Curry in the closing prayer said, Father, we thank thee for this two hours and 57 minutes we spent in thy service tonight. When our Lord was born, the wise men inquired at Jerusalem, where is he born? The star had led them to the country. Now, where is he that is born king of the Jews? And do you know which book of the Old Testament the people turned to to find the answer? Micah. In Micah 5 and verse 2, this was the passage that was quoted pointing to the coming of Christ. Telling his birthplace, Micah 5 and 2. We know, therefore, that Micah prophesied of Jesus because the passage foretold the place of his birth. And Matthew 2 and 1 says he was born in Bethlehem of Judea, just like Micah foretold that he would be. He was born in the right city. If you turn back to the fourth chapter, it sounds almost like Isaiah 2 about the establishment of the church. We know Micah is foretelling the establishment of the church, for he says in chapter 4, But in the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills, and people shall flow unto it. And many nations shall come and say, Come ye, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways. And we will walk in his paths. For the law shall go forth of Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among many people and rebuke strong nations afar off. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and the spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. But they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and none shall make them afraid. 
for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has, host has spoken it. For all people will walk every one in the name of the, his God, and we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. In that day, saith the Lord, will I assemble her that halteth, and I will gather her that is driven out, and her that I have afflicted, and I will make her that halted a remnant, and her that was cast far off a strong nation, and the Lord shall reign over them in Mount Zion from henceforth even forever. And thou, O tower of the flock, the stronghold of the daughter of Zion, unto thee shall it come, even the first dominion, the kingdom shall come to the daughter of Jerusalem. Well, there's no doubt but that that's a prophecy of the establishment of the church, the kingdom of our Lord, the first dominion of it. That's what verse 8 says. I suppose the second dominion will be when Jesus returns. And 1 Corinthians 15 says he'll deliver the kingdom to God, even the Father. That'll be the second dominion up in that everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But the first dominion was foretold by Micah in chapter 4. Now, since he is prophesying concerning the, the church, turn with me to chapter 7. And we'll, there's no doubt, it seems, and scholars generally agree that this is a prophecy of the triumph of the church and the, uh, the success of the church. But in verse 15, there is a prophecy concerning miracles. Read it with me. According to the days of thy coming out of the land of Egypt, will I show unto him marvelous things, things that will cause him to marvel. They'll be amazed at them. There will be miracles performed. The first part of this sentence, though, is according to the days of thy coming out of the land of Egypt, according to the days. I'm reading the King James Version. According to the days. Brother Moffat in the book of the lectureship has some good references showing that the words according to are used with reference to the number of those days. The number of the days. For example, in Leviticus 27, 18, Then the priest shall reckon unto him the money according to the years that remain under the year of Jubilee. You count out how many years are left. So according to the years is used in the sense, at least some passages, of count out the number of. And then... Another one is Deuteronomy 146. So ye abode in Kadesh many days according unto the days that ye abode there. Not talking about the uh, quality of their dwelling in that area, but the length of time. Notice Isaiah 2116. Within a year, according to the years of a hireling, all the glory of Kedar shall fall. It seems that this was where an employer and an, em and an employee were figuring up the wages and according to the years of a hireling with, within the space of a year, m measured as exactly as you would uh, your time card, computing the time that you had worked. But this same expression, both in Hebrew as well as in English, also is used in the Bible with reference to uh, the quality or characteristics other than length. For example, in Isaiah 59, 18, he said, according to their deeds. Oh, that's, that's not counting up numerical quantity, but the quality, the characteristics of it. Accordingly, he will repay. And so... The passage, both in Hebrew and in English, is ambiguous. It could mean either the length of or the quality of. But I'll tell you what I have seen. 
I have read the debate that Ben Bogard, a Baptist preacher, had with Amy Simple McPherson Hutton. I've forgotten how many other names she had, uh, or how many other husbands. But out in the Foursquare Gospel or some such name as that out in California, Bogard McPherson debate. And in that debate, she claimed she could work miracles and had the crutches and the wheelchairs and the braces that she had taken off of patients and, and had healed them and uh, had those stored up in different rooms. Bogard made this argument with her, and she couldn't answer it. She couldn't touch it. In the printed debate between uh, Rudd and Johnson, Bishop Johnson was uh, famous in Florida particularly, I think, but up and down the East Coast. And Don Rudd and uh, this Bishop Johnson had a debate. And he made this argument with Johnson, showing that the Scriptures foretold that miracles would last only about 40 years. According to the days of thy coming out of the land of Egypt, I will show unto them marvelous things. And Bishop Johnson couldn't refute it. More recently, Brother Guy N. Woods had a debate with Ben Franklin. Ben Franklin preached in the Church of Christ for 25 years and then went out to California, or uh, maybe he was already out in California where his preaching was done, but took up with this charismatic movement and claimed that he had been baptized the Holy Ghost and that miracles can be performed today. And... In this debate, which is in book form, uh, Brother Woods made this argument that even the prophet Micah foretold that miracles would last only about 40 years. And beginning with the baptism of John when Jesus was about 30 years of age, about A.D. 30, and the personal ministry of Christ that soon began after he was baptized of John, then... Add 40 years to that, you'll come to about A.D. 70. And all the miracles recorded in the New Testament occurred in that 40-year span. With the exception, of course, of the miraculous birth of John and the miraculous birth of Jesus Christ. They were some 30 years prior to that. But these marvelous things in general occurred within about a 40-year span in the New Testament, according to the record. When Brother Woods made this argument with Brother Franklin in the debate at Gadsden, Alabama, about 1971 or two in the early 70s, uh, Brother Ben Franklin, in response to it, in all, not exactly these words, but almost this, I do not recall his exact words, but about this way, he said, Brother Woods made this argument that Micah 7.15 predicted that miracles would last only about 40 years. And he said, I can't answer that argument, but I refuse to accept it. And that's not an honorable way to deal with an argument. But he had no other reply. I believe, brethren, that this will stand. According to the days of thy coming out of the land of Egypt. You remember that they were 40 years wandering in the wilderness. The spies had been gone for 40 days. And when they brought, came back and brought back the good report of the land... But the evil report, so far as their ability to take it is concerned, God said, because you followed these ten spies and rebelled against me, I'm not going to let you enter into the land of Canaan. And since those spies were gone for 40 days, I'll make you wander a whole year for every day that they were gone, 40, even 40 years. And so the wilderness wandering occurred until that older generation died off. And then God brought the younger ones that they had been concerned about. They had said, what about our wives and our little ones? God said, I'll give it to them. But you, you older generation that have lost faith in me, you're not entering in. So they were there for 40 years. And according to the days of thy coming out of the land of Egypt, God did indeed show them miraculous things, marvelous things, things that caused the people to be amazed. They could even say, we never saw it on this sort. And in that a notable miracle has been done. Indeed. And we cannot deny it. They couldn't dispute it. In the New Testament, God's messengers used miracles to prove their word. 
their teaching. Now, people try to prove their miracles by their mere assertions, their, by their claims. And we need to recognize the difference. The, a miracle that cannot be denied. And those miracles were performed, all of them in the first century, within a period of about 40 years, with the exception, as I've noted already, the miraculous birth of G John the Baptist and the miraculous birth of Jesus. The other miracles fell within about a 40-year span. After A.D. 70, I do not find a single miracle recorded in the New Testament unless you think of the book of Revelation, if it were written in A.D. 96, the vision that John had on the Isle of Patmos in the book of Revelation would be another exception. But all the others in the New Testament, unless you count that one, all the others fell within that 40 years ending about A.D. 7. And so, since that is true, then why should we not expect it to have been a matter of prophecy? And I believe that Brother Moffat's lecture in the book is a very valid one, a very fine one, and he reached a wonderful conclusion. He was not dogmatic about it. We could admit that it may be that the words, according to or as in the American Standard Version, as in the days of thy coming out, I'll show unto them marvelous things, but we can admit that it might mean the characteristic of quality, but also point out that it could very well mean, and I lean to the view, because I've seen it tested with Brother Guy and Wood against Ben Franklin, and it cannot be refuted. Thank you very much. On the... Uh business of justification by faith in the Old Testament, I recommend very heartily that you read carefully what uh, is in your book. Amen. Uh, Brother Moffat has a rather good rundown, and I do not want to go too much across some of the material that he gave. I will give simply some brief things that uh, might reflect a little bit uh, more along this same line, though I'm going to come to exactly the same conclusion. When we talk about justification by faith, has there ever been any other kind? Has a man ever been justified any other way than by faith? And if anybody ever was justified in the Old Testament, they were justified by faith because there never has been any other kind of justification. I believe we have a problem with terms. You know, the word justification and the word righteousness in the book of Romans are almost synonymous. I recommend very strongly that if you are not acquainted with Moses E. Lard and his commentary on the book of Romans, that you at least get well enough acquainted with it to read the introduction and the first chapter and its comments because of the use of the term justification. He gives a, in detail, a very learned discourse along the lines of the idea of dikaiosune, the Greek word which can be uh, translated justification, or it can be translated righteousness. And in nearly all of our English translations, it's called righteousness, but the righteousness of God can refer to two different things. One, justification, and the other, the eminent uh, attribute of his own goodness and holiness. So I agree wholeheartedly with Brother Moses E. Lord in his uh, analysis of what this word dekaiosune means. Now, you may think this is a rather detailed uh, situation into which I'm jumping that really doesn't make all that much difference, but it does in the book of Romans. Because if you don't know what uh, this word dikaiosune means in the book of Romans, then you don't know the book of Romans. Uh, the theme of the book of Romans is justification. And Paul is pointing out that justification has come by faith. And he needs to point this out to the Gentile out yonder who may have become, as Paul said in Romans 2, a law unto himself, whether he realized it or not. He needed to realize the only thing that would truly justify him would be on God's credentials of the blood of Christ. And the Jew particularly needed to know that his justification would not come through the law of Moses, but was going to come by faith. And thus, this seems to be the major argument of the first half of the book of Romans. How is a man justified? Jew, are you justified by law-keeping? No. Gentile, are you justified by 
uh, having the work of the law on your hearts and keeping that? No. The only way anybody and any time from the beginning of the world has ever been justified has been by faith. And I believe that's what Paul is affirming when he quotes from Habakkuk 2 and verse 4 in Romans 1, verse 17. He points out the gospel is the power of God to salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for therein is revealed the righteousness of God from faith unto faith, even as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Now that last phrase, the righteous shall live by faith, is the quotation from Habakkuk 2 and verse 4. Now, I believe that you and I will have less trouble with that passage if we'll just simply use the word justification or just. Most English translations do not use that. However, I believe the King James Version in Habakkuk 2 and verse 4 uses the term, the just shall live by faith. Now that's not talking about how well we live. It's talking about the quality of our faith. It does not throw out the window whether or not we live right. But that just doesn't happen to be what's under consideration. What's under consideration is upon what great principle can God be consistent and forgive sinners of sin? Romans is a judgment book. We're before the judgment seat of God. It's, it's, uh, it's a courtroom scene, if you please, at this point. And you and I come up before the court of our God, our eternal God. And he looks at us and he says, how do you plead? And we have to say, guilty, your honor. That's the only way we can plead is guilty. So he looks upon a guilty person, me and you. And he said, I therefore declare you innocent. Well, how can he consistently do this? Because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, God thereby looks upon us as righteous or justified because of a certain uh, thing that happened, and that is the gift of his son who paid that price for us. Otherwise, we would have to die. Now, it's a strange thing. He, uh, Paul tells us what Habakkuk 2, 4 means. Now, what Habakkuk 2 may have meant in its context had probably to do with the invading armies that God was going to use against Judah. And in its context, uh, though we're not sure exactly of the time of Habakkuk, it probably referred to the uh, Chaldeans who were going to come in and be God's instrument, as history records it, uh, against Judah. And the principle was then stated, but the righteous shall live by faith. May I suggest to you that there are two ways that could be taken. It can mean they should live a faithful life, or it can mean they shall live in the first place because of their faith, or upon the principle of their faith. And I take the latter view. And I think that's the way Paul is using it in, in, in Romans 1, verse 17. That there is one grand principle upon which God can be consistent, having given a substitutionary sacrifice of his son's blood for us, then there is one reason upon which he can be consistent, and declare guilty people to be innocent, and that is because of our faith. Now, this will produce faith, and I believe that's what Romans 1, 17 is trying to say. This will produce faith. If we ever learn that we do not have to be saved by law-keeping and perfect, absolute control of ourselves, then this will induce us to be the kind of people that will have that quality of faith. And I think that's what it means, faith unto faith, which is a problem of uh, exegesis to many of us. Now, let's talk a little bit about some terms. Forgiveness. I understand forgiveness to be that which takes place in the mind of God. It does not take place, as it were, in the life of man, but it's something that takes place in the mind of God. We even think that to be true among ourselves. I sin against my brother and I say, please forgive me. Well, where will that forgiveness take place? Not in my life. No repentance took place in my life. A confession took place in my life, but where does the forgiveness take place? In the heart and mind of the man against whom I have sinned. Forgiveness is something that takes place in the mind of God. Now then, the basis of that forgiveness is different than the forgiveness itself. Forgiveness takes place in the mind of God. The basis of it is the blood of Jesus Christ. Hebrews 9.15 said that a death 
took place for the redemption of those that were under that first covenant. And notice that he uses the term redemption there. The actual price paid was the blood of Jesus Christ. But that did not mean that forgiveness could not take place until the redemption took place. If we want to be technical about the difference in those two terms. And in Romans 3, verse 25, God set forth Christ to be the propitiation through faith in his blood to show that righteousness, may I say justification, if I might substitute that word in uh, Romans 3, because of the passing over of sins done before time in the forbearance of God. Here again, Paul announces that the basis on which God could offer forgiveness at any time, past, present, or future, is the blood of Jesus Christ. Now let's talk about promise. Some people mix up this idea of promise. And uh, when we talk about some of Peter's statements, that the prophets of old could not see these things yet, and to whom it was not re who, to whom it was revealed that not unto them, but unto us were these things given. Well, this is talking about the ultimate understanding and revelation of the promise. Galatians three also speaks about that God never intended to save anybody by law, but by the promise that was made through Abraham. That's the way Paul argued in Galatians 3. If there had been a law which could make alive, verily righteousness would have been of the law, but God granted it to Abraham by promise. I believe that's somewhere around verse 21 of Galatians 3. Then let's talk about the faith. Uh, in Galatians 3, we're all sons of God by faith in Christ Jesus. How often have I heard preachers misuse this? That's not talking about faith in one's heart. That's talking about appropriation of the revelation of God. Before faith came, we were kept in ward under the law. Uh, most of our translations are a little bit, uh, they could have been more helpful to us here. Because if you go back to the Greek, it says before the faith came, we were kept in ward under the law. Now, the faith is different than faith. In some instances, faith is used in the Bible to refer to four different things, at least. One of which is uh, the gospel, that unit of truth that has been revealed, like Jude used it. The faith that has once for all been delivered to the saints. Uh, I believe First Corinthians, uh, Second Corinthians 13, 5 mentions, uh, prove yourself whether or not you are in the faith. And now here in Galatians 3, before the faith came. We were kept in ward under the law. Well, that does not mean that there was no faith exercised, practiced, nor required in Old Testament days, but rather the faith was not yet revealed. The faith referring to that body of truth that we would usually just simply say the gospel. Now, another thing is law. Law has never been given to save mankind. We're under law to Christ today. I'm willing to affirm that. 1 Corinthians 9, 21, Paul said he was not without law, but under law to Christ. We have a perfect law of liberty, the royal law, the law of love. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind but what we are under law, but we're not under law to be justified. Now, there's a little different kind of an idea here between Old and New Testament understanding of law. Let's look. Uh, may I pull a Roy Deaver? May I suggest to you that this may give a mental picture of we are justified by faith. Uh, let's talk about the Jew first. The Jew was justified by faith, and then he lived under the law, not for justification's sake, but because he was justified, he was then given regulations for his life. That's how God uses law, to regulate our lives to live according to his wish, but not that which forms the basis upon which we are justified. And this is what Paul tried to argue with, the, or, or point out to the Jews in, in, his, in his arguments of Galatians and Romans, and if he be the writer of Hebrews, this also is mentioned in there. We, we just cannot understand that the Jew was ever justified by his law-keeping. Now then, we come to those who were not under the law of Moses. What happened? I believe we have justification by faith, and then they may have, as some of them, 
become a law unto themselves. Romans 2, 14. Because they could see God's law exercised or practiced in some other way, then they could see the work of the law written on their hearts, thereby they would become, as it were, a law unto themselves. Yet that was for regulation of life, not for justification. And then I would suggest to you that the Christian, if we don't look out, may have the same problem. But I won't do it this way. I want to make a big parenthesis that includes the law of Christ, because in one sense I believe the law of Christ is that which uh, uh, tells us about all of this. And were it not for the law of Christ, we would not know all of this. And if we use the term law of Christ synonymous to the idea of the gospel or the ultimate fulfilling, uh, fulfilling of the uh, revelation of those things promised aforetime, then we would have to say that justification by faith is still being practiced here, but it's within the precepts of the law of Christ. Now, Jesus doesn't intend to save us by our law keeping. We're going to be justified by our faith. Our law keeping is regulation in our life. But is it possible that we can talk about church attendance and giving and singing and praying and various acts within our life just as, uh, just as ignorantly as the Jew felt about his law keeping? Now, let me give you some other problems that are involved here. I must believe this because I think Paul agrees. Or rather, I want to agree with Paul. Let's put it that way. Paul doesn't agree with me. I agree with Paul. Paul said Abraham is justified by faith. Romans 4, 9. I want to agree with James. James said the same thing. Though he was emphasizing the godly life that must also ensue, he still quoted the same situation, that is, the same life, of the same man and said that it was counted unto him for righteousness, James 2.23. Paul said Abraham was justified. James said Abraham was justified. And then the writer of Hebrews said Abel was a man that worked righteousness. Hebrews 11.4, he was counted as righteous. And I believe all of the other 15 or 16 men that are mentioned, men and women that are mentioned there by name, were also people whose sins were forgiven in Old Testament days. Now then, there's some other examples that are not mentioned there. What about Enoch, who walked with God? Where did he go? Can an unholy thing abide in the presence of God? Would you have any idea that Enoch, when he left this earth, was not in the presence of God? Read Psalms 15.1. Who can abide in the presence of the Lord? And the whole psalm goes along the line that only those that are holy, evidently righteous or justified or forgiven, can abide in the presence of God. Now, where did Enoch go? Well, I'm not going to talk about Midway Island or whatever uh, uh, it might be that we talk about an intermediate state or present or estate. I didn't really understand all that uh, Hardeman Nichols was talking about the other day about that. And I told him I didn't think he understood it either. <laughs> but uh, let's don't get off on those particulars. I just want to know, did, did Enoch go to be with God or not? Now, was he a sinner or not? Did he live a perfect life or not? Or was he justified or not? Or was he forgiven or not? I don't have any doubt, whatever, that Enoch went to be with God. And no one can be in the presence of God who is not holy and righteous and forgiven. Therefore, justification must have taken place or that could not have happened. I'm willing to affirm the same thing about Elijah. 2 Kings 2. When Elijah went up into the heavens, seemingly those two men did not uh, die in the normal order that you and I think about human beings dying. But where did he go and with whom is he? And then what about Matthew 17 when Moses and Elijah came to be with Christ on the Mount of Transfiguration? Did that indicate that he snatched them out of, uh, out of hell to come and be with him and, and, and be involved in that incident? Well, no. They are in the presence of God. And yet no unholy thing, no sin, can abide in the presence of God. It's, just, it's out of uh, harmony altogether with the idea that, uh, to have the idea that uh, sinners can go and be in the presence of God. And yet all of those happened before Christ died on the cross. So let me suggest this. That when we, 
that when we talk about forgiveness and justification in the Old Testament, we're talking about an action that takes place in the mind of God. The basis for it may not have happened until Jesus died. I say may not, did not happen until Jesus died. The basis for it did not happen until Jesus died. The reason why, but God in his knowledge, and I hesitate to use the word foreknowledge because I don't think there's such a thing particularly as foreknowledge. We, we use that to tell us what we're doing. But God just simply knows. And because of God's plan and knowledge about the blood of Jesus Christ, that redemptive price was going to be paid, thereby he would justify in Old Testament days and forgive sins. Uh, I don't believe that this is really all that difficult to understand. Uh, it just simply means that uh, God knew it. God was willing, therefore, upon his knowledge to forgive those who lived by faith, and all of the Old Testament people were thus forgiven or justified in Old Testament days. Now, the basis for that justification was not completed until Jesus died. Well, as far as the east is from the west, I believe it is that Psalms 103 and verse 12 says, So God has removed our transgressions from us.